Tag dudes, today I'm going to be talking about the Linear Sharpener Bumblebee Embroidery Kits, Cut and Sew, Cut Sew Create Kits from Moda, Colored Vinyl Mesh, the Murdery, Murder Mystery Quilt Along, the book review will be for Making a Life by Melanie Fallick. I'll be demonstrating how to make a thread spool keychain, and there's a great giveaway at the end. I'm Sarah Lawson from Sew Sweetness. Thanks so much for joining me for Social Sunday, my weekly sewing chat. Hey everybody, welcome to Social Sunday. Thank you so much for joining me. Sunday, it's my favorite day of the week. I see Nancy's watching from New York, Charlie from cold Connecticut. Uh, it's certainly very cold here in Chicago uh, this weekend. Clovis is watching and Diana from Florida. So thank you everyone so much for joining me. Um, if you're watching live, thanks for making time in your week. And if you're watching the recording during the week, thank you so much for um, joining us as well. Um, we have some great giveaways at the end for both our live and uh, recorded viewers, so stay tuned for that at the end of the show. Uh, just a quick reminder before we get started, just about everything that I talk about during Social Sunday are things that I've purchased myself, so these are not things that I'm getting paid to talk to you about, but just cool things that I found that I'd like to share with you, and everything that I'm scheduled to talk about, I link to in the description, so if you're interested in finding out more about any of the notions, fabrics, books or projects that I talk about during Social Sunday, just check that link in the description and you can find out more information there. So last Sunday we held a vote for the next Sew Along that Michelle Graham is hosting in the Facebook group and we're trying to get um, those that are not on Facebook involved in the Sew Alongs as well. Um, the, the voting for first and second place is really, really close so we decided to extend the voting for one more week just in case you didn't get a chance to put in your vote. Um, as you can see by the graphic on the screen, uh, the Day Trip Wallet from Minikins Season 2 and the Rockstar Bag are really, really close. Um, so hopefully next Sunday we can get you the finalized decision what will be the next Sew Along project. Um, there's a link in the description in case you haven't voted yet and you would like to vote and we'll announce the results next Sunday. And then Michelle Graham will be posting information for the Sew Along very shortly for whichever project is the winner for that. So. I'm looking forward to seeing which will be uh, the next sew along. And Michelle runs uh, several sew alongs throughout the year, so never fear if your choice um, did not end up making the cut. Um, stay tuned because we'll be having some more sew alongs throughout 2020. So um, on to the show. My favorite part of Social Sunday is the notion of the week. And this week, I found this really interesting. Um, I've been waiting to get it for a really long time because uh, every time I went to order it, it was out of stock. but it is um, a sharpening tool for your rotary blades. And uh, I am looking forward to seeing the results. I didn't, uh, I pre-sharpened my blades before the show, but I did not um, actually cut with them because I wanted uh, my review to be an honest review and I kind of wanted to be surprised on the show. So uh, we'll see how the, the rotary blade works. I'm gonna jump over to the side camera, show you what the packaging looks like and the blade and we'll talk about um, how, how to use it. Okay, so this product is from a company called True Cut and it is a cutting blade uh, with a sharpening stone in, inside the actual product and there's instructions um, in the packaging for using the blade. Um, I'm just gonna run through uh, what I did before the show I have two different sizes of rotary cutters. Um, this is the 60 millimeter that we use for uh, in the studio for cutting cork and the other fabrics that we sell. And this is the one that I use um, for cutting quilting cotton and smaller projects. This is uh, 45 millimeter. So this is the one bef that I sharpened before the show just because it takes a little bit of time to sharpen. Um, let me just give you a quick rundown of how to use the tool. So first off, um, obviously you want to keep, I'm going to release the blade, you want to keep the blade straight up and down. You don't want it to go into the tool at an angle. Um, and you just uh, run it through. You can probably hear grinding as the blade is going through. That's the sharpening stone. According to the packaging instructions, you're supposed to run it back and forth 20 times. And that's what I did before the show. Basically like that you're supposed to keep it in the tool and then after you do that 20 times You're supposed to reverse the tool at a 180 degree angle So just basically the other end 
and then do the same thing 20 times the opposite direction. This makes sure that the sharpening um, stone is hitting the blade, um, I guess, at all angles. Um, so that's a quick down rundown of how to actually use the tool. Uh, and let me explain to you what I did uh, before the show to get this blade ready. So this is one of our old blades. So uh, my cousin Adam is responsible for lots of things, shipping orders, cutting cork, and he generally saves, we have little containers of five blades. He saves the old blades in a container until the container's full and then tosses them. And the container is safe because uh, it makes sure nobody else can get in contact with the, the blades and cut themselves. So this is an old blade, a blade that he's discarded um, that he deemed was uh, too dull to continue using. So before the show, I wanted to see exactly uh, what that meant as far as the dullness. So I played around with different um, layers of the cork fabric to see at what point would the blade stop working. Um, and I'm talking about the dull blade um, before I sharpened it. So before the show, I tried to cut through three layers of cork fabric and it didn't get through all three layers. So I have yet to test out the sharpened blade. So again, this is the blade that I sharpened before the show. I ran it through that um, true cut rotary blade sharpener 20 times in each direction. So a total of 40 times through the um, sharpening stone. And here I've got the three layers of cork fabric. So I'm curious to see if it can now cut through the three layers, which it couldn't cut through before. <coughs> Um, and it actually did um, slice through the three layers pretty cleanly. Um, granted, I have not used this for an extended period of time. I just uh, tested it out before the show, but um, the results are dramatically different than uh, what I had before the show when I couldn't even cut through the, the three layers of cork. Um, I'm gonna continue using this um, on our, or at least have Adam use this uh, with our cutting blades to see if it makes a big difference over time. So I will check in later on a future show to let you know how this tool held up as far as um, how many how many sharpens we could get out of the blade before we really couldn't use it anymore. So um, again, this um, sharpening linear sharpener is made by TrueCut and I've linked to it in, in the description in case you'd like to find out more information about it. And again, I'll update you on a future show when, I've, uh, when we've had time to use this over a longer period of time to see um, how it ends up turning out. So um, we're still trying to get the last uh, four, the four videos uh, finished for the next four pack video bundle. And so I wanted to show you uh, the second project from the bundle. And some of you might, might have seen it from the thumbnail uh, that we post on social media before the show. But um, this is the best friend pet carrier and my carrier I admit got a little has been a little bit crumpled because I've been you know throwing fabric on top of it and all sorts of things in the studio um, but this is kind of a dual use pattern I originally designed it for uh, toting pets uh, around either to the vet or wherever you need to take them uh, cats small dogs um, rabbits guinea pigs um, my bearded dragon will be going in mine um, However, some of my pattern testers have been making this um, into a gym bag instead because it would be a really great duffel or gym bag. All you would need to do to modify this to make it a gym bag instead of a pet carrier is to eliminate the, it's got zipper, it, you can probably see, but it's got zippers on the front and the back as well as on the top to make it really easy and convenient to put your pet inside. So all you would need to do to make this a gym bag instead of a pet carrier is to eliminate the zippers on the front and the back and just go with the zipper on the top for storing your your gym items in. So I've got a bunch of blankets in mine actually because we have been really short on space uh, around here since we're still trying to get everything packed up to get to the new house. But um, let me show you what it looks like inside. So this is the inside. The pattern comes with uh, a fleece or minky pet bed to go inside to make it really super comfy for your pet. And it also has a false bottom with, uh, let me show you our temporary false bottom. So I wanted the bag to be able to hold a lot of weight. So I'm estimating right now around 18 or 20 pounds or less. Um, we made sort of a, a trial run false bottom material out of quarter inch plywood. Ed and Robin who make our acrylic templates, Ed has made us some really nice plywood pieces 
which we'll be selling in the shop, I think for around 10 or $11. Of course, you could make this yourself if you have uh, the cutting tools at home or you can go to the hardware store and have them cut you a rectangle yourself. Uh, you'll just need to round the corners, um, but this is what makes it really sturdy and able to hold um, the weight of a pet. Um, another feature that the bag has, let me show you the top of the bag. Um, so this is the top view. It has two zippers on the top as well as a Velcro in the flap to hold it secure so you can put your pet um, in the bag through the top of the bag or if you're making the gym bag this will be your, um, your, your top closure for the bag. It also has metal frames in the front and the back. Um, I wanted it to be extremely safe for pets and so the frames hold the, the front and back of the bag open. As you can see, it's not collapsing. I was visualizing without the frames, the bag might kind of sink in or make it um, look not as cozy or inviting for a pet. And so I used two, I had these frames custom made. So these are different frames than the frames that I used in the tool bag, which I showed last Sunday. Um, but these are frames I had made for uh, the pet carrier and we'll be using these frames for future sewing patterns this year. And the frames are just inserted through um, the casing that's uh, in the bag. So again, if you make this as a gym bag, uh, you might decide to skip the, the casing, or not the casing, the, the metal frames because you won't need to worry about uh, the bag collapsing as your pet's trying to get into it. All right, so the, the frame is just inserted in the bag. Uh, the bag requires four frames. And um, I, I don't know, I was just really excited about designing this pattern. Danny's actually got four pictures he's going to put up on the screen right now. Michelle Graham, who made tested this pattern, this, these are Michelle's cats um, in and around her uh, best friend pet carrier. So I just wanted to show um, either a cat or dog. <laughs> That is a very cute picture of uh, Michelle's cat on the inside, and there's two more pictures as well. So Michelle made her version in Tula Pink's fabric line called Tabby Road, which features cats, so uh, very appropriate. You might have seen the lining fabric um, in that previous picture, um, uh, cat food uh, tins. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I'm really excited about the four new patterns that are coming out. Again, that was the best friend pet carrier, and we'll be showing the last two projects on our future Social Sunday shows. All right, so I have a question for you. Let me know um, if you have any pets. So let me know uh, in the comments. Uh, we have one pet, a bearded dragon. She's gonna be two this year. Um, I grew up with Australian Shepherds, so we did have dogs in the past, um, but we just have a bearded dragon right now. So let me know in the comments. I'm curious to see what other kinds of pets that people have. All right, so I have a bunch of uh, fabrics and kits and, and other things to show you, things that I've added to my fabric stash this week. So I'm gonna jump back over to the side camera and show you um, the things that I've added to my collection, so to speak. All right, let me move this cutting mat out of the way. Okay, so, so the first kit is actually an embroidery kit. Um, it was, I saw it on Instagram and I haven't actually embroidered in a little bit, but it was really beautiful. And um, as the title on the box says, um, how to paint with thread. So I think it's really accurate. Here's the, the artwork of the project. And let me show you what came in the box. Okay, so this is the kit. Um, an embroidery hoop was included. The floss colors needed to make the project as well as the pattern book, which is really detailed, um, how to stitch, how to create the, the project from the pattern, and then a little swatch of fabric. So um, this particular artist has lots of PDF patterns in her shop. Um, actually, Danny's gonna put a couple of pictures on the screen of some of her other works that she's shown on Instagram. These are actually custom um, custom things that she's made of people's pets. And uh, this is a, oh, sorry, Danny. I, I saw you shaking your head and I couldn't figure out right away. The frame of the okay, um, here is uh, one of the cat portraits that, portraits that she embroidered using the, the paint, her paint with thread method. And there's a dog one um, that I've followed up with as well. 
I've linked to her Instagram. This is Emily Ferris. I've linked to her Instagram in case you'd like to see some of the other things that she's made. I've also linked to her Etsy shop um, if you'd like to take a look at what PDF patterns that she has available, including that B. Um, I thought it was just great, um, and hopefully I can get started on that embroidery kit soon. Um, but I have a few other kits to show you. The next set of kits are from the Cut, Sew, Create uh, line of projects from Moda. So these are really fun projects, um, not only for kids, but if you like whimsical types of projects like these. And they include, this is a really cute monster zipper pouch that I picked up. Um, the fabric is, if I flip to the back, the fabric is printed and you just cut it out and, and put the, the project together. Let me open this up and show you exactly what's included. Okay, so that's the layout. It looks like there's some instructions inside, so full color instructions. And then all of the pattern pieces are, are printed out on fabric, which you can cut out, and they're all labeled. So I thought that was really convenient. So the monster zipper pouch is really cute, and the mouth is, is where the zipper goes. The other two kits that I picked up are both zipper pouches as well. This one is a sloth, so again, it's sort of a um, half circle shaped zipper pouch, and the fabric pan panels are printed for you. And the third one I, I picked up was a school supply zipper pouch. I really liked the scissors, the crayons. I thought it was really cute. And again, these are what the panels look like. Um, Moda has several other different projects in their Cut, Sew, Create line, such as aprons, pillows. Um, I think there was a cat pillow in there as well. So check my link in the description so you can check out the rest of the kits. I thought these would be really fun projects to make with kids or grandchildren. And then one other thing that I wanted to share is um, the pet carrier that I showed you. I used vinyl coated mesh. So this is pet safe mesh. It's coated with vinyl to make it um, stand up to wear and tear of being around pets, um, either um, nails or teeth, that kind of thing. Um, I picked up this from the hardware store. I also found some on online by the yard, but my friend Vanessa shared with me a source a website called Sew Michelle where she actually has different colors of this vinyl coated mesh and I picked up fuchsia and royal blue um, I'm making another pet carrier for the video when we film it and so um, she, Michelle has 12 fun colors in case you're interested in checking out um, the other colors that she has and these are great not only for the pet carrier but if you're looking to make a mesh bag with some quilting cotton accents, um, these would be really fun to use for that as well, especially in the really bright colors. Okay, so Danny's favorite part of the Sunday show, let us know if you're a bag lady or bag dude, be proud, let us know in the comments. And I've, um, I'm amazed at the community that has formed around, um, especially the term bag lady and bag dude. Um, everyone's been so supportive throughout the years that we've been doing the shows and not only supportive of, of Danny and myself, but supportive of everyone else in the community, saying kind things about finished projects in the Facebook group, um, jumping on before the show starts to chat with everyone before the show. And we really appreciate uh, you being part of the community. So thank you so much for watching and um, participating. Um, all right, I have a fun project to tell you about. Uh, my friend Deborah is hosting the third year of her murder mystery quilt along. So in a nutshell, each month, each month of the quilt along, she sends out a chapter of her murder mystery story along with instructions for a quilt block. So the quilt blocks come together a little bit differently than your normal quilt block. Um, the quilt blocks correspond to the location in the murder mystery. So this year we'll be traveling to Egypt. Um, last year was, I believe, Hawaii. And the quilt block instructions that you get um, kind of are uh, tied in with the mystery. This is from the, the Hawaiian mystery from last year. And as you can kind of tell, um, you don't get a full glimpse of what exactly the, the theme or the subject of the quilt is until you finish it. And so um, I thought it was a really fun concept. I liked the idea of the different chapters of the murder mystery book coming together with the quilt blocks and having a fun project at the end of the sew along. So I've linked to that in the description in case you're interested in reading out reading more about the sew along um, it's starting soon and so feel free to check that link in the description to find out more information so another question for you this is kind of related to that whole murder mystery theme 
what types of books do you like to read? So let me know. I like to read uh, historical fiction. I do enjoy a good murder mystery book. Um, actually, I just finished watching a TV show uh, based on one of my favorite murder mystery authors, Tana French. Uh, the show is on, um, Danny, what, what uh, TV channel was that? Stars. The TV show was on Stars, and it was called uh, Dublin Murders and it was based on two of Tana French's books. I just finished it last night and it was a really great TV series. We just had a free trial of stars just so I could watch that show. But um, yeah, uh, historical fiction and murder mysteries are my two favorite types of books, obviously, in addition to sewing and quilting books. Um, speaking of sewing and quilting books, I found a really great one. This particular book doesn't uh, include any kind of sewing or quilting instructions or projects. Rather, it's, uh, the whole book is about uh, different makers from all over the world and what making things by hand means to them and has meant in their lives. And I really had no idea. It sounded good when I read the description of the book online, but I really had no idea until I received the book um, how, for me personally at least, how impactful the book would be. Um, it's called Making a Life, and I'm gonna jump back over to the side camera and show you just a few snippets from the book. Uh, so it's a hardcover book. Um, it's over 300 pages long, so it kind of reminds me of a textbook from when I was in school. Um, it's called Ma Making a Life, Working by Hand and Discovering the Life You Are Meant to Live by Melanie Fallick. And it's all about Melanie's travels all over the world and meeting different makers of different handcrafts. Um, so this inside dedication includes this verse, um, how, or this quote, how we spend our days is, of, a, of course, how we live our lives. And Melanie had a really good description in her introduction that I wanted to read um, just about what um, handcraft means to a lot of different people. Um, so to Melanie, it's, she wrote, not surprisingly, given the calm and satisfaction that handwork brings me, a realization I came to when I became an avid knitter in my 20s and then quickly decided to meld my interest in it with my burgeoning career in publishing. Over the next few months, I spent many hours making things. Most of my endeavors were easy and small but required that I try something new. I did some shibori dyeing with indigo, carved stamps, lattice laced my sneakers, and dyed socks with matter root. I learned to use a strap cutter and a beveler to make leather bracelets and I inserted my first zipper when I hand stitched a pencil case out of repurposed Tyvek. Together with a woodworker friend, I built a bed swing for my porch. To my surprise, the most enlightening project was the simplest and seemingly most mundane, a box I created by strategically folding an ordinary piece of paper. Transforming that commonplace material in just a few minutes into a receptacle in which I could store something felt magical. It was so basic, almost primal. It was a skill that, like making my own clothing and growing my own vegetables, could have helped me survive if I had lived a very long time ago. In that box, I might have safeguarded seeds, small tools, or precious stones. As I held my box in my hands, I realized that in a circuitous way, during the last few months, I had been attempting to connect to my own survival. Even though I didn't need to make my own clothing, boxes, or bed, or much of anything to stay alive, I needed that bond to feel whole, competent, and grounded, connected to my heart and soul, to my community, to my ancestors, and to the natural world around me. So. Um, and as a result of giving myself time to wander and to make, I no longer felt lost. I understood myself better. So I think as a maker of things, that was a really important thing to read. And she also had this other thought in the introduction. Over the course of just a couple of hundred years in the so-called developed world, we have become passive consumers of products, services, and information rather than active makers, fixers, and even thinkers. Most of the time what we buy is made somewhere else by a machine or by people we'll never meet, sometimes working in conditions we would not accept for ourselves. Given these circumstances, it's not surprising that some of us are discomfited and feel a need for a grounding counterforce. So um, the, as I mentioned before, the, the basis of the book is stories and interviews with different makers. Um, and her first uh, interview in the book was uh, with Ellen Disson. Disanaki, I apologize if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, she wrote an essay, The Pleasure and Meaning of Making. And so she did, has done a lot of research over the years about making things, handcrafts. 
And so she was asked, um, in a traditional society, hands-on competence, learning to do what is expected of adult men and women is what growing up is about. And she wrote, girls were taught to prepare food, boys to make animal traps and fishing nets. In some groups, only females or only males made pots or wove baskets. All these skills were acquired as a matter of course by watching and interacting with others, and the skills were within the capacity of all normal people, capability of all normal people. Today, although they have the freedom to choose their own paths to satisfying work, not all young people can figure out their own place in the larger world where it is difficult to acquire the skills that will bring the money and prestige that have become the measure of success. In traditional societies, a material object that one made was tangible evidence that one had accomplished something, even though it might not have been the best. Participation was the important thing. So I think the important thing that um, Ellen was saying is that where making things used to be um, a valuable, seen as a valuable thing nowadays, it's um, all about how much money we can make from things. And so people are making less things. And she also says, all makers seem to feel that way and wonder why everyone else doesn't. Maybe everyone finds some essential thing they can do. I play the piano. My son likes to work on his car and to rehab houses. My daughter makes quilts. My grandfather was a cabinet maker. There are people who sing all the time. They might wonder why other people don't. I would guess that everyone has the need to make the ordinary extraordinary to artify in some way. So all of the chapters in the book are uh, maybe 10 pages or less, and each one is about a different maker, and all crafts are covered. Weaving, there, there's a weaver. Um, I, there's about, there's over 30 different stories that are told in the book, and the stories are all organized by groupings um, such as remembering, slowing down, joining hands, making a home, and finding a voice. And so, I thought it was a really good reflection, and I plan on reading a different um, a different maker's story every night before I go to bed. I read a few of them before the show, um, a yarn dyer, a quilter. There's a few quilters covered in the book. A uh, woodworker. I just bookmarked a few just to show you all the different types that are covered. Um, a metal worker and in this particular chapter, he mentioned, um, some of my best experiences creatively and artistically have included a moment when somebody told me I was doing it wrong. So that really, uh, that really stood out to me because, uh, I don't know, I feel like I, a, lot, a lot of times I like to do things my own way and sometimes how I do things is not how traditionally things might be done, but I think that's where innovation comes from when someone is doing something wrong and then they figure something else out about it. So um, that's a really brief review about this really great book. Um, I definitely rec highly recommend it if you can find it at your local library. This would also make a really great gift for um, sewers or quilters. Again, it's called Making a Life. It's written by Melanie Fallick and I've linked to this book in the description and it's a very, I don't know, it just really meant a lot to me to read um, the chapters that I've read so far. and. Um, the reason that I wanted to read one chapter every night is so that I could really think about um, each person's story as they tell it in regards to their craft. So um, the demonstration for tonight is uh, a demonstration written by Michelle Graham, who is an admin over in our Facebook group. And this is for her, her thread spool keychain. So it's a really easy no sew project but it's really cute and um, either a nice gift that you can include in swaps or um, I, I even have one for my Christmas tree so I'm going to jump over to the side camera and show you how to make um, this really easy uh, thread spool keychain. So you'll just need a few things. I think most of us have um, an empty spool of thread in our sewing room so I'm using a spool from Aurifil. Other spools, empty spools will work as well such as uh, from Guterman Thread, and you can use varying different widths of uh, ribbons for your spool. So I have all of my Renaissance ribbons that I keep in this little box. So as you can see, they're all different widths. So some of them are really skinny, some of them have a bigger print and are quite large. So I tried a couple different widths to see what I would like the best, and I decided to go with this um, Tula Pink ribbon from Renaissance Ribbon. So I'm going to grab my I plugged my hot glue gun in before the show so it would be ready. So, oh, yeah, that's hot. Let me grab that over here. 
Okay, so on the empty spool, we're gonna start by um, cutting the ribbon and actually heat sealing it. So I'm just gonna cut so that it has a straight edge. And by heat sealing, I just mean um, I'm gonna take a lighter and burn the edge of the, the ribbon. Be very, very careful when you're doing that. Heat sealing will just kind of seal the edges so that they don't fray. So the reason that the heat sealing works with this um, and other ribbons is because uh, this is a woven item and the, the heat just kind of burns and um, seals the, kind of melts the, the fibers. And so I'm gonna start winding the ribbon around the spool and I'm gonna use a little bit of glue from the hot glue gun. I think I might be about out of glue. All right, so we'll simulate that I had glue coming out of there. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and wrap the ribbon again. The number of times that you'll need to wrap your ribbon around the spool will depend on how wide of a ribbon you decided to use. Since my ribbon is super wide, I'm not going to need to wrap it around a whole lot of times. So I'm gonna cut it over here and I'm gonna heat seal the other end. Again, make sure to keep your fingers out of the way when you do this. I recommend putting some glue in the middle as you're wrapping and then of course when you get to the end, using some glue for that as well. Yeah, my glue's not coming out so I'm gonna use um, in a pinch just for this demonstration, I'm gonna use my glue stick just to hold it so I can finish. Okay, so this is the spool portion and this project also has some ribbon coming out of the end of it, uh, kind of that creates the keychain. So I'm using some bias tape from Vintage Door. Um, you can use ribbons as well, such as uh, really skinny, uh, solid colored ribbons, uh, whatever you prefer. To get the ribbon through the, the whole opening of the spool, I'm just gonna use my turning tool, slide it through, and then I'm gonna grab my threads from the other side. Okay, so I'm gonna pull the threads through, the ribbons through, and then whatever keychain holder that you have laying around, this is the one that I could find in a pinch, and so that just clips onto one end. So now you'll wanna pull this through. However much that you want sticking out, you'll be tying a knot on the other end. You'll add some glue from the hot glue gun over here, and then you'll pull the keychain hardware through to the other side. So th this is a really quick and easy project, and if you'd like to trim your ribbons a little bit shorter, you certainly can, but um, this is just a really nice keychain that you can add to your keys or to the end of your bag, perhaps, where you clip your adjustable strap on, and it's just a great way to decorate um, your bags besides um, just your regular uh, fabric and hardware that you've added. So. Um, just a nice quick project. Michelle has created a PDF document um, including pictures for each step and I've included that PDF document in the description so if you'd like to make this project at a future date. Thank you to Michelle Graham for uh, coming up with the instructions and Michelle Graham does a lot of pattern hacks which you can find on my website. If you go to SoSweetness.com um, under the tutorials tab, you can find a sub tab for pattern hacks and some of the pattern hacks are listed there on the website, such as for how to make the paladin pouch into a crossbody bag. That's, a, that's been a popular one lately. So thanks again, Michelle. So um, I'm gonna be answering some questions live in just a second. So if you have any questions for me, a sewing related question, question about a notion or tool, uh, bag making question, go ahead and type your question right now in the comments on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, before we get over to that, I wanted to announce the two winners of last week's uh, giveaway. So we had two live winners last Sunday and two winners out of those people that uh, watch the recording of the show later in the week. Uh, so the, the third and fourth winner are Amanda Parks and Cheryl Silver. So congratulations to Amanda and Cheryl. Um, please email me and we'll set up your prize and we'll be giving away uh, four 
of my upcoming four pack video bundle sets um, at the end of the show. So stay tuned for that. All right, so Danny's looking through for some questions. I'm gonna grab some water really quick. Clyde says, what did you just use in place of the ribbon? So this is actually, uh, let me grab my, I used in a pinch just because I didn't have a ton of ribbon around in the studio that was thin enough that I liked for this project. This is actually a crocheted um, bias tape made by Vintage Door. Um, I picked it up at a trade show a couple of years ago, so I'm not sure if they're still selling it. Perhaps they are. It's really cute. It comes in different uh, prints and colors, so of course they have solid colors as well. I really like the polka dots, and it's um, a thinner bias tape, obviously, with the, the crochet finish on one side. So this would be really cute to add to projects that you have bindings, such as pot holders or, um, I don't know, perhaps zipper pouches if you have this ex accentuating the zipper. Um, but I just, I just thought it would be really cute with the, um, the red spool and the pink uh, Renaissance ribbon that I use. Cindy says, hang it inside the pet carrier for, for your cats. That is a great idea. Something to keep them occupied where the, when they're um, zipped up inside the pet carrier. Teresa says, speaking of sharpeners, what do you use to sharpen your fabric scissors? So I think maybe a year or a year and a half ago, I sent my fabric scissors off to a sharpening service. Um, I think the website is simplysharper.com and they have locations in Wisconsin and Texas and you just choose whichever one's closest to you. Since I live in Chicago, I sent my scissors to the location in Wisconsin. Um, so you mail the scissors in, they sharpen them for you and they mail them back. So um, I thought it was a really quick and easy way uh, to sharpen my scissors and I think I got them back in about a week. I think their website, if I recall correctly, um, the the process was uh, seven to 10 business days, but I got my scissors back really, really fast. Um, Camille says, does the copyright on your books prohibit making the bags for sale? So um, the copyright on my books and the same thing for my patterns is for my actual written instructions or any of my photographs or if there's illustrations such as in the book, um, in my previous two books. Um, so that's what the copyright covers. That just means you can't uh, distribute my instructions or books without my permission, um, sell without my permission, things like that. Um, so the copyright doesn't cover if you're making and selling things from my pattern. So um, I am very happy for anyone to use any of my sewing patterns to make and sell bags either at craft fairs or online such as an, on Etsy. So I don't restrict that and in fact the copyright doesn't even cover that. The, co the copyright just covers my um, instructions, photographs, and illustrations, and pattern pieces, things like that. Sarah says, for the pet carrier, will the metal frame bars be able to be removed to wash the carrier? Yeah, you sure can. Um, let me see if I can show you taking the frames out. Um, I did this when I showed the tool bag last week, and it was pretty easy, although this bag's a little bit bigger, so let me see if I can get the frame out quickly on, on camera. <laughs> Now I, I can see because I'm on the spot and on the spot it's not gonna come out for me quickly but uh, yes there's uh, basically a casing kind of similar to a casing that you have if you have like a hoodie with drawstrings or if you have joggers with uh, drawstrings in them uh, the casing makes it so that you can uh, take the drawstrings out or put them back in so let me see about getting this uh, metal hardware in. Yeah, for my tool bag, certainly, I've taken the, the frames out a bunch of times, and I did have in mind um, actually washing the bag because I didn't want the metal frames to be going through the washing machine or dryer because I could imagine it causing like a lot of ruckus or loud noises with the metal going through the washing machine. All right. All right, so my frame's halfway in. It's kind of like inserting um, elastic. You kind of just push it through slowly until it goes through. So I've got the frame inserted over there and to take it out, you just push it back through uh, the casing. So let me show you taking it out really quick. So it's pretty easy. It's the same process, slowly pushing and pulling till you get the metal frame back out. 
Okay, so I think you get the idea. The frame's starting to come out, and I would just continue pushing it back out until it was all the way out. Elizabeth says, this is the rock star part of the new four pattern. So uh, the new four pack that's coming out at the end of January is four brand new projects. The rock star bag video, which has been much requested, will be in uh, the following four packs. So I feel like, um, I don't know, I'd hate to promise a month and not be able, be able to follow through. Perhaps March, uh, we can get another four pack out with the rock star bag because that one's been much requested. Um, Certainly throughout last year, Danny's laughing. Am I being too, uh, <laughs> I think he thinks I'm being too ambitious. <laughs> what fabric did you use for your Rockstar bag that's behind you on the shelf? Um, this is made uh, from a fabric. This was actually made for me by Rock Baby Scissors, Christy from Rock Baby Scissors. I don't remember the fabric line, but it was uh, Windham Fabrics was the manufacturer. It was made for a trade show. Um, I, I guess I'll have to find out the name of the fabric line so when I get that uh, question asked again. Pamela says, Sarah, do you use Best Press for your projects? Um, I actually use, um, I've used Best Press in the past. Um, I use a uh, flattening spray by Soak. It's called Flatter, um, F-L-A-T-T-E-R. Um, it comes in unscented and different scents, just like the Best Press does, and um, it's a starch alternative spray, um, the flatter that I use. Um, Lori says, how do you get neat looking ends on the Bellevue pouch? Um, if you mean the um, zipper tab ends, I think it was maybe three, three or four Sundays ago, I did uh, a demonstration on the live show about how to make your uh, zipper tabs look nice. So if that's what your question was in regards to, um, if you go on our YouTube channel and in the search box type in um, zipper tab, I think you can just probably type in zipper tab. The um, show that that was on should pop up. And I talked about it in great detail, but basically you want to be sewing right up um, just a hair to the outside of the zipper tabs, but not sewing through them. Um, and I again, check out that uh, live show for that demonstration. Patricia says, do you always sew the lining with a 3 eighths of an inch seam? Uh, I guess it depends on what bag that I'm working on and what seam that I'm sewing. Um, oftentimes it's helpful for your lining to sew uh, the seam allowance slightly larger than the exterior. So for example, if you're sewing the exterior using a quarter inch seam, um, sewing with a slightly larger seam allowance such as 3 eighths of an inch will help the lining um, be a little bit tighter and less baggier. Sometimes it depends on the types of fabrics that you're using though, and again, it, it will oftentimes depend on the actual part of the pattern that you're sewing, what, what's the seam. Um, but in general, sewing with a slightly larger seam allowance can help with a tighter looking lining. Brenda says, does sewing with faux leather on a home machine take any special needles or feet? So with faux leather, you wanna use either a Teflon foot or a walking foot. And we actually did a video last year talking about different needles and different fabric types, what needles to use for what fabric and bag making. So if you check either um, the website, sosweetness.com or on the YouTube channel, um, I, I believe if you type in needles for bag making, that particular video it should was pop up. Posted on Facebook as well. And Danny says it was recently posted on Facebook as well. So um, that was a discussion that we had about the different types of needles, uh, different fabrics, what to use and when. Carol says, when you are sewing with vinyl or cork, which sti stitch length should you use to join the pieces, not meaning the top stitching? So I generally use uh, 2.5 millimeters uh, stitch length for just sewing the pieces together on my machine and I like to increase the stitch length to three millimeters for most top stitching. Sometimes this depends though on um, the amount of layers that you have, the types of fabrics that you're using. You can always do a quick test sew with your fabrics and interfacing before you start on your project. Basically, if you see your stitch, if you're sewing, um, top stitching is generally what I'm talking about here, but if you're top stitching and you see your stitches are really, really close together so that they look really tiny, generally that means you need to uh, lengthen your stitch length so that they look nicer. However, sewing the bag parts together is kind of a different thing. You don't necessarily need to have um, nicer looking stitches per se because you're just uh, kind of sewing the guts of the bag together, if that makes sense. 
Love your socials, uh, your Sunday socials. Can you use a walking foot on a machine as opposed to an industrial walking foot machine? Why or why not? So um, if you're talking about using the walking foot for um, making layers easier to sew with or if you're using materials like leather or vinyl, a walking foot will definitely help with that. Um, my machine, I use a Juki TL2010Q sewing machine, which some people call it a sort of a semi-industrial. It's not a true industrial machine. It's a, a home sewing machine. Um, I rarely use my walking foot unless I'm machine quilting a quilt. Um, so I suppose it depends on your machine, but definitely if you see your regular machine struggling with layers or top stitching, trying the walking foot is definitely the first step to see uh, about solving that issue. Cherry says, I have some vinyl that is thin and flimsy. Should I interface it to make a bag with it? And what interfacing would you suggest? So this is a tough one because sometimes it depends on the actual pattern or project that you're working on. Um, in this case, I would say feel free to email me either a picture or the name of the, the pattern or project that you're working on and we can talk about um, what types of interfacings may be for the bag. Um, just because some bags are um, have a lot of structure or um, the type of bag needs certain interfacings, I guess I could say. Um, but my email address is sarah at sosweetness.com and that's Sarah with no H and I'm always happy to talk about um, different options as far as um, changing fabrics out or what types of interfacing should, should you be using or if you should be using something thinner. Patricia says, has the sew along bag been announced yet? So we're still, we're extending the vote uh, for the next sew along project for another week because it was so close between first and second. So as you can see from the graphic on the screen, the day trip cell phone wallet from Minikin season two and the Rockstar bag are really, really close. There's a link in the Trails description. Um, Danny says it's trailing by 30 votes because Danny's fast at math. Thank you, Danny. There's a link in the description of today's show uh, to vote if you haven't voted already. And we'll extend it for another week to see if uh, things even out a bit or if one project comes out on top. And we'll announce that on next Sunday's show. Sandy says, is a yoga bag pattern in the future? I do have that on my short list of patterns. Um, I can't say uh, when or... Or, or when I might be coming out with a, a pattern for a yoga bag, but I was thinking about when I originally wrote it on my spreadsheet, maybe two different types of yoga bag in the same pattern. I'm not sure, just wishful thinking, I guess. Uh, but I'll let you know on a future show about uh, other future patterns that I'm thinking about coming out with uh, in the near future. Denise says, I want a mug too. Um, this There's actually uh, a few comments about the mug. <laughs> um, you know, we did want to carry these mugs in the in the store, and I think we were a little bit short on space. We're trying to work on that because I kind of I really love this mug, um, proud bag lady, and it has a so sweetness lo logo. It was made by the Middle Elephant um, Elaine O'Hanlon, and she offered to make these mugs for us to sell on the website. We just didn't have space at the time, but perhaps we can revisit that and have something for you soon. Gloria says, "Is the animal carrier one size? Um, it is the single size." I decided rather than going for two or three different sizes to just go with the one size bag which can fit um, my bearded dragon up to uh, Michelle's cats as you saw in the, the pictures earlier. Kelly says, if I don't want to use um, lacy zippers for the Westminster pouch, do I need to make the seam allowance changes to make the zipper sandwich instead? So um, I haven't personally <clears throat> I haven't personally made this particular project with a regular number three dress skirt zipper. However, I have seen a lot of people in the Facebook group make it with that type of zipper and their pouches looked really great. So I'm assuming since I didn't see any kind of notation in their posts that they just use the same seam allowance as, as per the pattern. Um, but I guess I can say that I drafted that pattern specifically for the lace zipper. So um, I guess I'm, I'm a little unsure, but if anybody has made that Wind uh, Windsor pouch with the regular number three zipper. Let us know in the comments because Danny can search for your comments and uh, follow up with an answer to that question. <coughs> All right, Danny's calling that on the questions for now, so I apologize if I did not get to your question live. We're going to be giving away, <coughs> oh, my voice is failing me, we're going to be giving away four bundles to four winners of our, my upcoming four pack video bundle. So we're gonna give away two of them live and then two 
out of anyone who watches the show during the week. So the way we draw the live uh, winners is we go back, Danny looks through all the comments from tonight's show since the start of the show. And I'm gonna give Danny two numbers uh, for each winner and he's gonna let me know the winner's name and post it on the screen. So um, if you are the winner, please email me just so that I have your email address. And my email is sarah at sosweetness.com and that's Sarah with no H. All right, so Danny, I'm gonna give you my first two numbers. There's up to actually 132, <coughs> so you need three numbers. Three numbers, okay. Or up, you know, one to 132. Okay, gotcha. All right, we're gonna go with uh, one, 120. And number, we'll go with number seven. <coughs> <laughs> Stay time out bag. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what this reference to, but. Renee Manandice, uh, congratulations to you, Renee. You're one of our winners. All right, uh, we're gonna choose one more live winner, so we'll go with uh, page number seven of our comments. And we're just, just so you know, we're going off of our software, which combines comments for both Facebook and YouTube. Um, how about 19? <coughs> it was Cheryl, but I probably had a different. Okay. Cheryl something, let's see who it was. There's so many comments rolling through, it pushed her before I can press it, so I have to find her name. Okay. It's Cheryl something. There we go, I see it. Yeah, right there. Okay, thank you, Danny. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't fast enough to click <laughs> Danny, you're too slow tonight. I'm um, Cheryl Eisenacher, so Cheryl is our second live winner. Congratulations to you, Cheryl. We did not want to leave out um, all of those who watch the recording later on in the week, so we're going to save winners three and four. I'll draw those um, at the end of the day this Saturday and an announce the third and fourth winner on the show next Sunday. So. All you have to do to be eligible for that giveaway for my th number three and number four slots is answer my question in the comments, either on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you watch our live shows. My question is about how many times a week do you sew? Let me know in the comments, um, maybe how many days, how many hours, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, let me know in the comments, um, how many times a week do you sew? So thank you so much for joining me for Social Sunday. I had a great time, I hope you did too. Have a great week and happy sewing. Bye everybody.